everyone. Yeah. How you doing? Yeah. Woo. Yeah. Thanks for coming. Yes. All right. Welcome to the 400th episode. Yeah. Wow, rowdy, rowdy bunch. Oh, shit. Right. So, yeah. I'm really excited. I've been uh, like a kid in a candy shop for the last few weeks thinking about this. Um, two of the most successful people in their fields. Two of probably the biggest celebrity names in the UK in their fields, maybe even in all fields, um, have agreed to come and be your special guest at the 400th podcast episode. And I think it's a real privilege that we all get to spend time with these people. I feel really privileged that they've become really good friends of mine since, well, Kev, we go back a bit further because we've got a property and business relationship when Kev got into property. But really, it's my work with them on my podcast that kind of um, kicked everything off. Jake Wood has his very successful podcast, Pound for Pound. Kev's podcast is launching before the Strictly show, the Kevin Clifton show. Uh, we went down to Southampton where he was doing one of his shows and did three episodes with him. So this really is all in about podcasts. So I want you to be involved as much as we're involved, which means that um, certainly for, I would say, at least a third of each of the interviews, I'm going to open the floor to questions. So I'm going to give you a little bit of time to prepare what your one question might be. Now, we're theming tonight on secrets to your success. Because actually, Kev's been interviewed twice on my podcast before. He's one of only maybe four or five guests that I've, I've interviewed twice. Kev's got a great story. He's done many great things. Uh, and he's very honest and open about some of the challenges he's had in his journey. But I want to make sure the interview with him tonight is a little bit different from what you've had on the podcast before. And... Whilst we did talk a bit about Kev's success, we talked more about his journey. We didn't really get into what makes him a great dancer, you know, what made him win strictly after five or six or seven goes, and what does he think makes an amazing dancer, etc. And I'd like to theme it like that, just so that the 400th and the 401st and the 402nd episodes that come out, they have a little bit of a unique flavour to them. We also have another special guest. Now, I, uh, I invited Aston Merigold... JLS, and Yanni, who's got a huge YouTube channel, who's the, the rap guy who's massive in cars. They both said yes, but they couldn't do this one. Aston said, put me in for the 500th. So I'm doing 500 episodes every day to get that one in quick. <laughs> <laughs> um, but someone who's coming today, hmm, he's, his sister is w wildly famous. Um, and he is in her band and he writes her songs. And I've got to know him recently. He is the most lovely man you'll ever meet. He's just started a podcast. I've been advising him on that. So he's coming up with Jake. Literally, Jake's been filming all day and he's driven straight up. So, you know, Kevin is a really busy guy. He, he gets one day between his current tour before he's on to Strictly. So that's like a full football season. One day off, full football season. So Jake, been filming all day, gets in the car and comes up here. So I know you're all excited. I can sense you're all excited. But these guys have really delivered for us. And, you know, they're not getting paid. They're just doing it um, because they love podcasts and they want to help our community. So, Kev, I'm really grateful. Thank you. Really appreciate it, mate. Let's give Kev a huge round of applause. Yeah. Um, that wasn't actually your intro, but oh. just come up. Come up. No, 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 right. But come up anyway, that's all right. Now, as you can see, I've got no questions. I want it to be really conversational. Um, but Kev, the first thing I would like to know is what you've been dancing since you were four, correct? Yes. And you are now 30, 36. 36. Yeah. So you've been dancing 32 years. Yes. You must have seen some amazing dancers and many dancers who were good but didn't quite make it and many average dancers. Yeah. What makes the best dancers? Um, I think the best dancers are the ones that they've got a sort of a good grasp of technique, like they've worked and worked and worked, but they, 
like th th that'll bring you to being a good dancer. But the, the the best ones are the ones that can connect with people on an emotional level. So to me, it's the ones that can make you feel something. And I suppose like like any arts, like like with acting or or singing. Um, I suppose even if if you imagine like your fa your favorite singer is not necessarily the greatest technical singer in the world, but there's something about the music, there's something, there's something about a, a certain song or something that makes you feel something. Well, you, one um, of your favourite singers is Robbie Williams, isn't he? Yeah. Who may be not the best technical singer. In no, the no. But like, like I really feel something like when he's um, with his songs or, or when he's performing. And so for me, the best, the best dancers are the ones that have that ability to, um, yeah, to make you feel, that, that can connect emotionally with you. Yeah. And so on Strictly... Is it different? What makes a winner of Strictly different to what makes a great dancer? Uh, I know the answer is yes, by the way. Yes. <laughs> yeah. um, are you talking in terms of the celebrities doing it or, uh, or, or as us pros? Well, it's, tell us, we've got all night, mate. Okay. Tell us all. <laughs> well, in terms of the celebrities, like, I, I, I don't know. Like, it depends on who the audience get behind, really. Um, and, and that can be many different things. I think... People watch Strictly, and I think a lot of the time they like to see someone who wasn't necessarily brilliant at the start, and they have to work really hard, and they see a lot of improvement. And also, like I said, with um, with just being a dancer, that they want to connect emotionally. I don't. I think people get bored of watching someone who's just kind of kind of perfect in terms of technique and lines and, and things. They don't want to be given a display of something. They want they want to get excited by it. So. Um, yeah, and with the, with the pros, like if I if I was to do, I haven't done the and been in the dance competition world for quite a while. Um, I I stopped doing that in two thousand and seven, so twelve years now I've been out of the competition scene. Um, if I was to go and do competitions nowadays, um, I probably wouldn't get anywhere. Whereas I used to be quite successful in it, but I probably wouldn't get anywhere um, because it's judged in a very sort of technical technical way you have to satisfy this and tick that box and 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 whatever um whereas on if if some of those if some of the top competitors in in dancing competitions if they were to cross over to strictly come dancing i think a lot of them would struggle on strictly because i don't think they would understand that like i said the audience are, the audience are looking to get excited the audience are looking to feel something um with with what they're watching they don't want a technical display of, a, of, a, of sort of expert movement sure yeah so it's, it's sort of two different things like um and i mean i've been trying to win strictly for for years it only only just finally happened um, <laughs> not that it matters <laughs> yeah oh, it's all about the celebrities it's nothing about the dance <laughs> yeah i've been saying no, that. nothing about us yeah for six years i've been saying you know it's all about the entertainment <laughs> and it's all about the audience and it's all about the show um and and the winning really doesn't mean anything but like that moment when they called out our names so <laughs> the final was a pretty good moment. Um, but yeah, I, I think, you know, I, I think that was probably the combination of, you know, the, the, the pro and celeb. Uh, I was dancing with Stacey Dooley on the, on the last series. And, um, <laughs> and, um, Kieran, shut up, mate. <laughs> and uh, I, I think people took to her because she was just, like very normal people. Could, it's, it's about relating to people, isn't it, yeah. all the time in, in anything. Um, it's the same with like, I don't know if you're interviewing someone or, or anything. It's just about like relating to someone. I think people related to Stacey. She was a normal girl. And people see themselves in her going on that journey of trying to work as hard as possible uh, at this new skill and just doing her best. Um, and she did work hard she, and she really improved. I think she sort of displayed that. Like the first um, couple of weeks we were doing, what, uh, uh, eight hours a day training and we were getting fours and fives out of ten from the judges and, um, and sort of not doing as, as well as we'd like. Um, and she just went, oh, I don't want to get kicked out early. Like, I, I, I'm really enjoying this. I want to I do better than this. So I think we need to put more hours in. And we ended up doing 14 hours a day. Of, of training and, and her improvement just just went through the roof she just kept just kept improving and improving and I think people like that in someone and then I don't know with me it was probably a bit of a sympathy vote that went along with it because <laughs> because I've been runner up four times yeah. um, so people were probably thinking yeah I really like her she's really hard working she's doing a good job 
and she's dancing with him, just give him it. Give him, <laughs> give him the win just once. Like, <laughs> he's, he's paid his dues. <laughs> yeah, so I, I think there's a lot of factors go into it when it comes to strictly, specifically. So popularity, liking to see someone work hard, like to see them improve, not yeah. necessarily perfect, relatable, make you feel something. Yeah, I mean, th there were two girls in, in the final, um, one of them from the Pussycat Dolls and one of them from Steps. Um, both lovely and, and both brilliant dancers, but they were brilliant from week one because they were mm. professional dancers before their pro partners were professional dancers. Could you argue then it was harder for them because the expectation was higher? I, I think it was easier for them to get to the final um, but when it came where, where the judges have nothing to do with it and it's just down to public vote in the final, I think they had a big task on their hand to convince the public to vote for them to win. Yeah. I think everyone in, loved them and enjoyed what they were doing. Nothing had, no one had anyone against them, but to inspire someone to get behind them. and, and uh, It's a funny thing in, in this country, I think um, we, we love an underdog. If someone's really good from the beginning, we, we, yeah, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> we immediately take against them, yeah. <laughs> and it's like we, we want someone who's not great, but they're working really hard. Like, <laughs> like we champion hard work here, don't we? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So I think, yeah, I, th I think that had a lot to do with it mm. on, on on Strictly. Mm. Yeah. So in your shows, Burn the Floor, Rock of Ages, yeah, where you have maybe a bit more creative license, yeah. Do you work on the emotional connection part? Is it something you're really thinking about? How can I move these people and make them feel something? Yeah, more than anything. Yeah, yeah that, that's, that's the, main, the main ingredient for me. It's linking emotion to everything because yeah. then, then people will go along with it. Like, like I said, people's favorite song usually is, is a song that relates somehow to a certain feeling or, or, or memory. Mm. Um, and, and I, think, uh, I think Tony Robbins does a lot of that sort of work. Like, like he gets you to link emotion to a certain thought or desire or something that you want to achieve. So it's not just like, oh, I'd, I'd like to achieve this. It's like, what would it mean to you? What would happen to you if you don't achieve this? Or, or you know, and how would it change your life if you do achieve this? And like, put yourself in that position. How would it feel? Like, that's what Tony Robbins is doing um, when he talks about stuff. So it's... It's all about linking emotion to stuff. So when I'm going out as a performer in, in anything, whether I'm acting, singing, dancing, um, my main aim is, is to make people feel something. And it's, it's less important, actually, um, say, like when I'm singing in, in Rock of Ages, um, it's less important to me, like, whether I hit that note perfectly or whether my voice is a bit rough that night or whatever, as long as the audience feel something as long as they get excited they get emotional you know they, they get um you know they get goosebumps or like whatever the thing is or they're laughing because it's comedy yeah. as long as they feel something then they're, then they're hopefully gonna yeah. enjoy it or be inspired in some way or yeah, yeah get excited or whatever the thing is yeah. so it's all about that emotion for me yeah so um, i'm a great student of really successful people and um i don't know if you've watched this yet kev i know many of my community have but on the 2nd of january i watched them at a documentary on Alexander McQueen called um, McQueen. Right, I haven't seen it. Really moved me. Um, one of the best designers that ever lived. Uh, he be, I think he was the head of Givenchy at 19 years old, the head designer. It was just like unheard of what he achieved. Mm. Um, and throughout his life, he got a lot of criticism for his work because it was quite dark, mm. a lot of skulls, a lot of death, a lot of darkness in his design. And he said pretty much exactly the same thing. He said, you come to my show... I don't care if you love it. I don't care if you hate it. I just want you to feel something. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. And I think he really needed that. And I think humans really need that. Mm. And you uh, watch an amazing Netflix documentary or, um, you know, you're moved or inspired by someone or a film or a hero. It's, I think it's spot on. It's because they make you feel something. They make mm. you feel alive. They make... Cause Alive is not just about feeling good, it's also about feeling sad. I mean, mm. some of the best music in the world is some of the saddest yeah, music yeah, in yeah. the world. And so do you see that as your job, as a dancer and an entertainer, to take them on like a journey? Yeah. Are you looking for lows as well as highs? Yeah, well, like, like when I'm teaching my celebrities on, on Strictly Come Dancing, I, I, I encourage them to go all in on something, to, to like give absolutely everything to a performance. Like, don't, don't ever play it safe. 
Don't ever try and sort of hold back in any way in the hope that like, it might not be the best that I can do it, but it's not going to be a disaster. You know, like, like being scared of it being that disaster. That's what I want to shy away from. And I, I always say to them, like, I would rather, so for those who don't watch Strictly, we get scored out of 10 on Strictly by the judges for each performance. And um, I, I say to my partners, like, we, we, we aim for the 10, obviously, but I would rather you get a 2 than get a 6. Because I think if, if you get a six, it's sort of, it, it's safe, it's, it's, it's all right, it's, it's fine, you, you, you got through it, you did okay, um, it wasn't brilliant, but it wasn't a disaster. Um, whereas if you get a two, at least I, I feel like people got something to talk about. <laughs> <laughs> people, you were shit! <laughs> yeah, people, people are going to remember you. you you're, you're on some sort of journey, like you're saying, you're on some sort of journey. If you're getting a two, you're at the bottom. Yeah, you're at the bottom. <laughs> you got somewhere to go because then next week we can come back and and if it's yeah, you get a three. Yeah, three, but then yeah. but then if we get but then if we get like an eight or a nine a couple of weeks later, yeah. it's like oh my god, look at that, look at that, Im yeah. look at that improvement. You know, all of this. Whereas if someone's gone got a six and then a seven and then an eight then they're sort of, they're already there. Or especially if they're all just getting eights right, right off the bat. It's like, where do you go? Yeah. Um, and I suppose but, to get a two, thinking about it, there'd have to be some kind of disaster, which might mean a major fall. Mm. And to make a major fall, you might have to try a hard move. Yeah, exactly. It's about risk. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, you've just got to, you've just got to go for it. Like, like I think, it, which dance was it with Stacey that we did? Samba, which was... Sort of, she wasn't a natural Latin American dancer at the start. Like a couple of weeks earlier was when we were getting fours, doing a cha cha cha, and she was real nervous about the samba because it's probably sort of the most similar dance. And uh, she was like, you know, she she was asking me, is there something that we can do that sort of just make sure I get through it and safe? And I'm like, absolutely not. I said, so we, we dressed her up in, in a dress full of feathers. There was feather fans everywhere. It was like, everybody look at this and take note of this is going to be a massive performance. And I said, just, I want you going absolutely flat out. Energy, energy, energy. I said, I don't care if the technique is all over the place. I don't care if there's like steps going wrong. I want you going flat out energy and have an amazing time mm. because I think people will really enjoy it if you just go for that. Yeah. And people did enjoy it. And you know, technically there were <laughs> issues everywhere, but then people started getting behind her because they were like, look at her having a go. And, and, and I think a lot of people just thought, you know, I, I want to, that, that's what I'd <laughs> hoped to do if I was on that journey on, on Strictly and people were relating to her. Yeah. Whereas there might have been a slightly better dancer that week, but they got forgotten about because yeah. they, weren't, they weren't all in. Yeah. You know, it, it wasn't like just all cards on the table, go, bang, yeah. flat out, give everything you've got. Like, go there. But I guess if someone like Alexander McQueen says, I don't mind if you love me, I don't mind if you hate me, I just want you to feel something, and you're mm. saying, I don't mind if you get a two as long as you don't get a six, yeah. it sounds like what you're saying is the extreme ends of the emotions mm. are where you experience life, where you can have a comeback from a failure, yeah. and maybe where you get remembered. That middle ground of anything, does it get remembered? Mm, Do the, exactly. Does the middle of anything get remembered? Mm. I don't know. And I've got my haters. Like, the, you couldn't have any haters. I've got so many haters. But you are lovely. No, like, like I'm, I'm just learning to what, not what look do, at what do they say about forums you? or you know, what, social worst, media stuff. What's they're, the worst trolling they're horrible. you've had? Come on, what's the worst you've had? The worst. Because I've had some good ones, mate. I've had some good ones. <laughs> These guys know. Um, Has anyone ever called you a bitch licker? <laughs> A bitch licker. That's what they call me. I had to look it up in the dictionary. Was it there? Yeah, it means something. Does it? I'll let you, on the train back, I'll let you have a look at that. Um, what, what's some of the things? Um, dick rider, have they ever called you dick, dick rider? Dick rider. Yeah. No, no, yeah. no, no, not that either. <laughs> um, wanky as fuck. <laughs> Apparently some of my videos are wanky as fuck. You've really got your haters, have, haven't you? Hey, I have. <laughs> Love me or hate me. Um, I, I had one of them that I read, which was quite funny, was that, that it said, um, 
Kevin Clifton's wig is terrible. <laughs> I was like, I'm not wearing a wig. But like, I'm 36. So like, yeah. <laughs> Um, yeah, so I get that, and then, you know, oh, yeah, it's always like, you know, he looks like this, and he looks like that. Like, just, you know, they attack the way you look, and, uh, or the way you talk. You know, stupid stuff um, like that. And, um, and people come up, if they just don't like you, they just don't like you, and they'll come up for reasons why, oh, he's the, he's the golden boy. The BBC are doing everything just to make him win. He, he's the, you know, he's, he's the favoured one all the time, blah, 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 blah. And I'm like, I wish I would be, because then I would have won already. <laughs> like, <laughs> instead of coming second near, like, near, nearly every year. Um, but yeah, yeah, there, there was some... S- I, <sighs> we're, we're sort of sat here and, and to talk about how to be successful and all that sort <laughs> yeah. of stuff. So what I want to tell you, everyone, is, is no, you don't let that stuff bother you. But of course it does. Like, you can't... I'm, I'm human, you know, like, so... When you, when you read it, you but read. But if they don't know you, why does it bother you? Well, what, yeah, why does it? But for some reason, it does. Um, I, I know that it shouldn't. Like I know sort of the, the stuff, but I I'm not great at it. Like I do, I, I do read it sometimes, and, and it's like an addiction. Sometimes it, it's like you just search out that. Like you can have loads of nice comments on social media, and you'll just keep scrolling until you find that one. <laughs> That one that's had a go at you and, and, and made you feel horrible. And then that's all you can think about like, for, yeah. for the rest of the day. And you can let it ruin your day. Um, I, know, I know I shouldn't look at it. But yeah, of course it does. Like, of course it can, can affect you. It's you, just how you go forward from yeah. there, I suppose. I mean, as you've got more successful, you must have more. Yeah. So have you, do you think you've got better at handling it? Uh, probably in the last year. Like, uh, six months to, to a because year. Because you've been in the press a lot more. Yeah, I've just, yeah, been thrown in in the deep end, I, I, I suppose. Yeah. Like, it's one of them things, again, where what, what I feel like I've experienced a little bit is while I, while I was that guy that was coming second all the time on Strictly, um, the, I never really had that much problem, like from the press, for example. Um, they quite liked me and they, they championed me because I wasn't the... Um, the tall, dark, handsome, muscular, good-looking guy that was just winning and, and you know, mm. winning at life all, all the time. I was like pasty kid from Grimsby <laughs> who, who couldn't quite win. So everyone was all right with me. <laughs> everyone was fine. We like him. We like pasty little Kevin. <laughs> but as soon as, as, soon as, uh, as, soon as we won, that it, it turned. Like, like I suddenly started ex- experiencing, you know, um, th- like they just wanted to find stories and take things out of context and write stuff about me. And I've read so much stuff about myself in the last sort of six months that has nothing to do with any kind of truth. They just make stuff up. Always an inside source says. And it's like, well, well it's you, isn't it? You're the inside source. <laughs> <laughs> an, inside, an inside source saying something is just a person saying something, <laughs> yeah. isn't it? Like, if, if, I go, if, if I go right here now, like, even in front of anyone, or even if I just said it to one person, Rob Moore's a bitch licker, <laughs> that doesn't mean Rob Moore is a bitch licker. It just means someone said something. You know, and if that person is a journalist, then I could be an inside source said. That doesn't make it true. Um, you might be starting something here, though. Yeah. <laughs> After that happened, someone sent me a T-shirt with ha- hashtag bitch liquor on it. Really? Uh, and then Bobby said, what does bitch liquor mean, David? <laughs> <laughs> oh, so you've got better at handling it um, because you've been forced I to. I just had to, yeah. yeah. It's one of them things of, like, just... I, I couldn't run away from it. I just, yeah. it, was, it was just there, constantly. And then, and then some people believe it. Like, some people feed into this sort of gossip and stuff. Yeah. So, they, so then I get messages on social media, Kevin this and Kevin that, uh, and they know nothing about anything. But, yeah. but then suddenly I'm just being bombarded with all these messages from people. Yeah. Um, usually, you know, it, it, it's just some sort of faceless person on, on Twitter where they, where they don't put their names, just a load of numbers or something. Yeah. Um, and um, how do you but, clear your mind of that when you're about to do a show or, you know, you need to step up? Um, well, what's been really nice is that like, I've, I've been on tour for, for all of this year so far, and I always come out of stage door and, and see people 
um, afterwards, you know, if, if anyone just wants to say hello or, or you know, take a picture or, or whatever. And actually what I've found is um, people in general, actually, people just when they're face to face are nice. Mm. Pe- pe- people are, are actually decent. It's just sort of this online culture of, of you know, faceless trolling type stuff where people feel like they can just have a go or say something. Or, or, and the press, the press just want to sell newspapers and, and they're not going to... They're not going to sell a newspaper by saying Kevin did a good show today. Yeah, you know, at the front of the sun. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> yeah. Woo! Exactly. Like, no yeah. one's going to buy it. Yeah. So, so they have to find something that sort of feels controversial, and you know. Yeah. Um, so, so they just they just twist anything into something that sounds controversial, yeah. and anything that'll do as as clickbait and stuff. And and the more I've seen it, the more I'm starting to get immune to it. Um, it, it's just, yeah, I guess it's like anything, the more, the more you practice anything or the, the more you get, you're just thrown into something, the, mm. the more you get, the more you get used to it. Like, like when, when I first came here, um, yeah, when I first came to Progressive and, and was doing all sorts of stuff, I went on one of the courses, I've done sort of a few of the courses and, and, and I went on the course that was, was about speaking, um, the speakers, you know, how to do mm. speeches and stuff, I can't remember the name of it, but um, I came here and um, I was sat at a table, with, with just like one of these round tables with, with a group of people and we were sort of saying hello to her. And, and I was like really shy and, and people were going, um, oh, you know, hi, and what's your name? Oh, my, my name's Kevin. And, and, and this uh, lovely lady next to me asked me, and, and what, what do you do? Um, <laughs> what? <laughs> no. <laughs> uh, and, 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 and I said, oh, um, I'm just doing some norm, normal bite-a-lets. <laughs> <laughs> um, and, uh, and, oh, right, so yeah, yeah, property, property, yeah. Um, what do you do? Are you full-time property? No, 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 no. Oh, so you have another job? Yeah, yeah, yeah. What, what, what do you do? Oh, I'm self-employed. <laughs> because, because, uh, because uh, like... I know because I'm do things because I'm on TV. The perception would be that I'm like mad confident. I'm not at all. Never have been. Um, and and I couldn't bring it. Uh, like I, it wasn't within me to say to her, "Well, I'm one of the most successful professionals on Strictly Come Dancing." <laughs> Did you not see my hips as I walked in? <laughs> but like, <laughs> mate, you have practiced that for me. <laughs> but um. But I was sat there. You got going, a lady's blush in the <laughs> front, mate. I was sat there going, "Yeah, I'm, I'm self-employed." And she, said, "Oh, okay." And then she asked me, "So, what is it that you, that, that you do?" Oh, you know, just you know, a bit of here. And I couldn't say it. And then she, and then in, in the end, she said, "I don't want to be rude. You don't have to tell me, but like, you don't. What is it that you do? Because you seem quite like like you don't want to say." And in the end, I said, "Oh, I'm, I'm, I'm a dancer." Oh right, and then sort of left it there, and and because I've been so embarrassed about it, she assumed like I was some sort of stripper. (laughs) 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 Like, (laughs) like, is it that kind? Is it that kind of dancing that you do, like in the in the the clubs? And I was like, no, look at me, of course not. (laughs) Yeah, that'd be unsuccessful. That's why I'm here. but in the end, it sort of came about, and I said, "Oh, you know, I'm on, have you heard of a show called uh, Strictly Come Dancing?" And she went, "Hang on, you're Kevin from Strictly Come Dancing." <laughs> and then it went round the room, and everyone, you know, everyone sort of got excited, and oh, I know, yeah, 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 and we were taking pictures and, and whatever. But at that time, I was really scared of sort of speaking like in front of people. Now it feels a bit easier. Like like right now, I'm. Like this didn't seem like a problem. Like before, a few years ago, I, I would have been like, I'd have been like really nervous and sweating and. and no, I'm doing that much. <laughs> <laughs> I've worn the wrong t-shirt for that. Um, right, everyone, pop your hands. Yeah. <laughs> um, but it's like anything. The more you sort of throw yourself into something, and with property, like when I said, I had zero clue what what I was doing, like how to go about being a property investor. Um, you know, now I'm doing it. Yeah. Um, it's like, like with anything, you throw yourself into it and just accept that you, I guess if you just accept you're not going to be perfect at it. So like with all, getting all the trolling and, and all that, you just accept, you know, I've got no experience with this, mm. you know. And you talk to people who have been through it before, yeah. like the whole, you know, mentor mm. thing. Um, 
uh, I, so Rob's been mentoring me for for a while. Um, you, you, one of the first things you said to me was like, if you haven't got any haters, you're not doing enough right. Mm. Like, which is kind of along those same lines, I suppose, of like throwing all in and either the ten or like the two. Um, you, you've got to go all in and go straight towards something. Um, and I also just spoke to um, to other people who have been in the position that, that or that have been on TV like a lot longer than I have and gone, how do you how do you put up with this? Mm. And 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 some of them say, oh, I'm just, I just don't hear it. And, yeah. uh, and some say, like, it was the first time I had to deal with it, it was, it was horrible. And, and uh, you know, like, you, you, think, you think that the whole world is talking about you and, and, and you think that it's this massive deal. You, put, you place all this importance on it. Um, but the truth is, no one cares. Mm. No one really cares. Um, and that's probably a good thing to remember with any of it. Whenever you're feeling, like, like worried about what anyone is thinking of you like going into something or you're nervous about it no one cares like um six months ago when the, the, the newspapers were having a go at me about something that i was going oh my god everyone i think everyone hates me and and uh you know every, everyone's talking about this thing that's going on in in my life the truth was probably people would probably just scroll past it on their phone went oh there's that guy he's done something and went on to the next thing and then <coughs> went to get their shopping, make sure their kids got to school and then watch Netflix or something. Ooh. Like they don't, pe like the, in general, people don't care. Probably, you know, a massive percentage of this room probably didn't even know who I was as I'm walking onto this stage. So like, it's like, you feel like the whole world is caving in, but it, it in. Mm. it's fine. Well, I was hanging out a fair bit with you while that was all going on. I never read one inch of those columns. I've, yeah. I, no idea what they were saying. Mm, yeah. So yeah, it's funny. We we think what we know what people are thinking, but yeah, they they got their own problems. They got their own things to worry about. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Than have your column inches top of their mind. Yeah, and 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 I'm, I'm trying to sort of keep relating to it, so it's not just all talking about dancing, but like like the same like coming here to, to progressive like when I was first sort of talking to people and trying to network and I had no idea how or how to talk to people and talk to people about property and it, I just had this like imposter syndrome of oh I don't know what I'm doing here I, I, I don't know anything about I don't know enough about property to be here and you assume that everyone in the room is an is a property billionaire <laughs> and and they and they know everything, every detail, you know, about every law to do with mortgages you know, and, and tax and, and whatever. And you're completely out of your depth. And, and that if I say anything, people are going to think I'm an idiot. And they're, they're not, are they? They're not. People just want to meet people and, they're, and they're, they've got their own stuff going on and their own deals and their own, you know, whatever. And they just want to chat about it. Yeah. So like it's just getting that like imposter syndrome out the way, mm. but it's it's always been there with me. It's always been a massive challenge for me. I think just recently I'm starting to yeah. get better at it. So um, Kev's podcast will come out in when do, are you allowed to say when Strictly starts? Yeah, well it comes on TV in September. Okay. With, with the pros we're getting your podcast out week. before Strictly starts. Yeah. that was the pact we made. Wasn't yes, it? yeah. So um, sometime the pact it, that we made about two years ago. <laughs> yeah, we're gonna, yeah, I'm going to do when a I podcast. When I said before Strictly, I didn't mean 2025. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I'm going to do a podcast. Yeah, no, I'm just going to procrastinate for a yeah. little bit longer yeah. because if I start talking, people are going to think I'm stupid and they're going to judge my podcast and there's going to be loads of comments saying, I hate this podcast <laughs> and I don't want to hear his voice anymore. Get rid of him. <laughs> Hopefully that's not going to happen. No, that won't happen. Right? <laughs> so um, the reason I said that was because um, Kevin, um, I was very proud that Kevin let me interview him for his first episode of his podcast and he was very open about some of his imposter syndrome and stuff like that that he mm. felt. So listen to that first episode, definitely when it comes out in a few weeks' time. But back onto the theme of secrets of success. Mm. Um, I know there's some people that you admire greatly, you know, that you think are very successful. I know you've mentioned people like The Rock or mm. Robbie Williams or, mm. you know, people like that. So whether you want to talk about specific people or general, what traits do you admire in other successful people? Um, the main, the main one, hard work, like, and I know that's really, really obvious. But like when when you see someone, um, when you I hate laziness, and and when you, when you see someone like The Rock, like he's just he went from being sort of he tried to he wanted to be an American footballer, and and went all guns blazing at it, but kind of failed. It didn't go the way he wanted it to, and then he became 
a pro wrestler. Mm. And he just worked and worked and completely conquered that world. And then he went on to, to make movies and he's just worked and worked and worked and, and conquered that. And, and you see on his social media and everything, he's just relentless. Yeah. Like, and now he's got all, he's such an entrepreneur, he's got all these businesses, he branches out and everything he does um, seems to become a success. But because he just seems to be relentless in, in how hard he works. Yeah. Um, I think what I admire in someone like Robbie Williams is one as a performer he has that ability to connect emotionally like like we we talked about um but also he's quite humble like um he, I feel like he has these sort of two sides to him that's why I'm fascinated with him he has this side of him that is over the top performer Robbie Williams and people would think that he's arrogant then that's this sort of ego performance side of character of him but then you hear him being interviewed and he's got all the same insecurities as anyone else, like massively um, insecure and um, worried about what everyone thinks and, and uh, struggles with a lot of stuff. And um, <clears throat> I think when, when you hear people like him talking about that stuff, it's really cool because, yeah, you just realize, guys, thinking all them same things that I was thinking. And, and uh, you know, because it's, it's, not, it's not just that people are born as these genius greats, like people... People have insecurities, like all the best ones have all these insecurities. Keep plowing through, keep failing, keep getting rejected, but keep going, keep working, 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 working. Um, and then just seem to become really successful. So, yeah, it's, yeah, it's that ability to keep working past failure and, uh, and, and rejection. Mm. Like, to get, for me to get to the, my, uh, like me and Stacey winning Strictly on this last series, like I got rejected by Strictly twice. Like I really wanted to be a pro on the show. I got, re I, I got turned down twice until I finally got the job. And then I've been like so close so many times uh, to winning and then finally on my sixth year on the show, got there. It's, it's, it's become a long journey. And then to get in on the show as, as well, um, cause just because it's things aren't an overnight success. We were talking about it this earlier when people think that people can just become overnight success there's usually years of work that's gone in um before that um like for me I, I was dancing as a competitor and then I joined um, a show called Burn the Floor um a dance company and and just worked my nuts off for for years for that company and the director of the show was a guy called Jason Gilkison and um he like we started off we were performing in front of like no one. At, at first, we were performing in front of about 15 people in a casino um, in Reno, Nevada. Um, and then I remember once we performed in a theme park in, uh, so Bush Gardens theme park in Florida, in front of one guy eating <laughs> burger and chips. <laughs> like, and he wasn't there to see the show. He was there for the burger and chips. It just so happened that we were, we were performing while he was there and he was sort of half watching us. And that was my career as a dancer at that time but it's every time even if it's one person eating a burger still go out and be all in mm. go for that tent go give everything you've got on stage that day and and um we were trying to you know the show was trying to get bigger and bigger and bigger and there was a chance that we might get to make it to broadway um once the show had become bigger we were in san francisco and we got told there's these producers in and they're looking to take the show to broadway and it all kind of hangs on tonight's performance. And we've spent a lot of money on this and whatever. If, if we get to go to Broadway, it's everything that the company's ever dreamed of. If they don't want us, we're, we're bankrupt and the, the show will cease to exist. And at the time, I had two, um, both of my shins were full of stress fractures as I'd had shin splints but kept on dancing. And then I'd <laughs> then developed into stress fractures. And I'd seen this uh, doctor while we were on tour in Australia uh, who was looking after like the Australian Olympic team or something. And, and he said, right, here's your, he took scans of my legs and he went, right, here's a perfectly good leg and here's a leg snapped in half. Both of your legs are about here right now. <laughs> and I was like, okay, so what happens now? Like, what, how can I, what do I need to take? <laughs> <You know? laughs> and, and he went, you need six months off, six, seven months of complete rest. And I was like, I, I can't, I can't do that. Because I'm going to miss out and we're trying to get the show to Broadway. And da, 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 da. 
So he gave me this machine that to, to do things that I had to stick my legs in every night and, and I was taking loads of ibuprofen and I'm sure it wasn't like the healthiest. But, um, but there was one night where Jason Gilkerson, the director, came to me and he, and, and he said, right, and I was having a few shows off because of my, my legs. They were being very careful with me. And he said, T tonight's the night, basically, we, we make it to Broadway or we don't. And he went, I know you're in pain, but I really need you on stage. Just can you give me tonight? I'll give you the rest of like the next few weeks off. Can you get on stage tonight? And I was really struggling. And I said, yeah, okay, I'll do it. And, and, and went on stage. And, you know, it wasn't just me. It was like the, the whole cast were working really hard. And um, we got, just went and gave everything that night. And we made it to Broadway. And the show went really well on Broadway and was working like solidly. Like it was so much work um, to, to stay there. We kept getting extended. It became a big success. Um, skip forward a couple of years later, I'm trying to get on Strictly Come Dancing. I got rejected on the first time I auditioned um, because, <laughs> because I was an emo goth kid with long hair and black eye makeup and <laughs> black fingernails and they said, we, we don't really have any need for a goth. <laughs> um, <laughs> Oops. Uh, so, um, so I cut my hair and, and smartened my act up a little bit and, you know, thought I'll try and look a bit smarter. Like, changed my image and went and auditioned again the next year and got told no again. Um, and then the next thing that happened was um, they, they had one extra place on, on the show. They'd gone because they were like competing with X Factor, I think, and they wanted to make the show bigger. So it went from 14 to 15 celebrities. So one extra place opened up. And on that year, they hired Jason Gilkison as their creative director of the show. <laughs> and they said, we... We've got a short list of people like that we've seen. Um, we, we need to hire one more pro. We're not sure about him. Da, 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 da. And like, so I'm told. So he's told me like, like in that meeting, Jason Gilkison said, um, I don't know why you wouldn't hire him. Like, if, if you hire him, he'll, he'll work really hard for you. And I got the job. <laughs> and, and so it's like, it's that. It, it's just copying that, that work ethic in, in, the, in the people... I admire because, like, my uh, my dance talent didn't clearly didn't get me the job. <laughs> my dancing alone wasn't enough to get me the job, or and they weren't happy with my image. <laughs> so I feel like it was the the biggest factor in me getting on strictly was work ethic, mm. and 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 Jason vouched for me at that moment and yeah. said like he he will work hard for you. Mm. This is a question that's asked on a lot of podcasts that I try and avoid. Okay. <laughs> so um, suddenly it's going to get fired at me in front no, of loads no. of people live. Yeah. <laughs> but it's, it's actually a good question. And I think it's relevant to the theme of secrets of success. If you could meet the younger you, maybe just starting in the pro world of dancing, what would the you now give advice to the younger you? Um... Other than cut your hair. Right? <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Um, I'm, I'm big on this at the moment because I'm, I've just been reading the values factor that you told me to read. Um, uh, I would say, like, just you've got to live your truth. Like, get, get in touch with, with what you want and don't think that you have to pander to everyone else all the time. I've, I've like, I feel very lucky that I've, Every, sort of everything's gone well and I've, I've done well for myself but I also think that I've probably wasted a lot of energy worrying what everyone else thinks of me and as a consequence living my life for other people all the time and, and doing what I think I should do as opposed to what I want to do mm. and you know the things that I really hold like as my top values and priorities yeah. like like I should do this it's only in the last year I've, I've sort of started turning down choreography jobs because I've I've, I've said oh, I'm going to I'm going to be this dancer until that point and then I'm going to be this top choreographer and panicking about it because it's, it's quite stressful choreographing stuff and then I've recently gone oh, actually I don't think I want to be just a choreographer I actually want to perform so it's like okay so go and perform then like who are you trying to impress like trying to impress people with doing that like I, I, I I, I turned something down just recently because I, w I was close to accepting it. And then I figured out that the only reason really, when I properly, honestly, was brutally honest with myself, 
the only reason that I was doing it was, or that, that I was about to accept it, was that so I could show off about it on Twitter. <laughs> so I could go to all the trolls. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Ex exactly. Yeah, I, like we're laughing, but like exactly to all the trolls that go, oh, he's this and he's that and he can't do that. And I was going to go and I was going to accept this job purely to go. Yes, I can. Look at me. I'm doing really well here. But the truth was, I didn't want to do it. Mm. Then I would have stressed out about it or, or like trying to impress your parents or trying to, you know, in, impress a boss or just or some ideal that you've placed on yourself of like, I need to be this person. Yeah. If you're not that person, you're not that person. Mm. Like, you don't have to be anything. You, you be what you want to be. So I would say to my younger self, don't waste too much energy trying to be something that you don't want to be. What a session so far. Please give Kevin a huge round of applause. Thank you. All right. <laughs> this next one's a bit different. So Ricky's full name is Ricky Wild. Um, he has sold 20 million records. That is a lot of records. Yeah, 20 million. Um, he's a songwriter, a producer. He's in a very famous band. They're huge in Germany. You may have heard of Kim Wilde. Have you heard of Kim yeah. Wilde? So Ricky is Kim's brother, but of course, also band member, songwriter, producer, a man of many talents. And I really think he's a lovely man. I've been very um, privileged to get to know him over the last few months. And I'm really excited to see him. It was a total surprise. So please, could you, could you give a huge round of applause for Mr. Ricky Wilde? Come on! Come on, Ricky! <laughs> Take a seat, wherever you like. I'll sit here because I think Jake should sit. Okay. Um, how long have you known Jake, by the way? Uh, probably about four years, I yeah. reckon. Yeah, maybe longer. But um, me and my wife, we host a charity night every couple of years. And, um, and we heard that Jake had moved, had moved in about five or ten minutes around the corner to where I lived. <laughs> so um, we just dropped a little a letter through the door saying, there's anything you can... Donate for the for the uh, for the auction and and bless him. Him and Ali um, were really helpful, and now they come to well, all our balls and and, and with uh, it, Jake does the auction section for us as well. So, mm. but we've just got really close through that, and then we we started up a poker group, and there's like ten of us all playing poker. So, <laughs> and so we're all good mates. Yeah. Now, exactly, yeah. <laughs> right, Jake, you ready? Yeah, you're all good. So, I mean, Jake obviously doesn't need a huge introduction because he's so famous already, but I think I should give him one. Um, I think the biggest thing Jake's done in his life is come on the Disruptive Entrepreneur podcast. <laughs> uh, which, uh, <laughs> and um, he's not even listening. But, um, but obviously, a huge role in EastEnders. Um, really talented man in many areas. Really interesting, funny, fun guy to be around as well. So please give a huge round of applause for Mr. Jake Wood! Thank you. It's lovely to be here. And um, congratulations on 401. Thank, yeah, thank you very much. 401. So, yeah, this will be, this might be 401. Right. This might be 400. Yeah. I it suppose it depends. Be, probably yeah. Be. <laughs> 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 well, right. <laughs> What's about? Poker. Where are you playing poker next? <laughs> <laughs> What do you think it takes to be one of the best actors in TV? I wouldn't know. <laughs> <laughs> Ask David Jason. Yeah. Or, they, or someone you've seen. <laughs> uh, what does it take to be a great actor? Um, yeah, hard work, dedication, uh, a stubbornness to want to succeed against every kind of uh, every little bit of logic. Um, you know, it's a, I think it's a, in some ways it's a career you have to be driven to. You, you know, I think probably maybe like dancing, any artistic sort of venture. There's so many years before you get any rewards that in the face of that, everyone always looks at you. No, I met someone recently at a party about a year ago at a Christmas party. She said, what do you, you do? I said, I'm an actor. And, she, and there's this little pause and she said, is that a proper job? <laughs> I said, yeah, it seems to be working for Tom Cruise, you know. 
I don't know. <laughs> but, um, but yeah, there's always, there's always, uh, there's always this perception, you know what I mean? But you know, is it, is it, you know, how do you monetize it? I suppose is, mm. is a thing, and, and is that your drive, or are you doing it because you, you know, money was never my sort of uh, my drive. I did it because I loved it. Mm. Um, and I think you know I was always passionate about it from from the minute I started doing that I started acting professionally from the age of ten, which is quite unusual. But I grew up in Islington, in North London, <clears throat> and there was a very good um, drama club around the corner from where we lived. Uh, a woman called Anna Shear, and basically her drive she'd set up this uh, drama school in the sixties to get kids off the street in Islington because it's quite a rough area. There's all these poor kids walking through the door, so you had Kathy Burke and. Linda Robson and you know just these rough kids walking in off the street and I was one of those kids you know so I went there when I was 10 and um, kids that got there if you were lucky you would get a little bit on TV so when I was 10 I did my first professional job and I knew absolutely from that moment on that that was what I wanted to do mm. you know uh, you know of course there's no guarantee at that point that you're ever going to do that job it's one of those jobs that people you know thousands of people want to be actors and, and there's no guarantee that you're You'll make a career out of it. It doesn't matter how much you want it, how much mm. you desire it. You just, you know, you're, you're gonna, have, you know, you need a little bit of, a little bit of luck and a lot of hard work, mm. you know, and a bit of talent. Yeah, <laughs> you're going to be humble, just like Jake is, just like Kevin is, because they're the kind of people you are. Um, and so there must be some kind of serendipity about all of you being here at the same time. But if you could try not to be too humble for a little <laughs> while, um, and what what has made you so successful at selling so many albums? And I really ad admire people who uh, last for decades. It's easy to last for a song or an album, mm -hmm. but decades. Because you're like huge in Germany at the moment, you guys, aren't you? Yeah, we had um, a, a new album out last year, and we've got another new album coming out uh, in the next, next couple of weeks, a live album mm. of the album that we recorded last right. year. So I'll tell you how I can make this question different to how I did with Jake mm. and, and Kevin. How do, you remain, how do you become very successful for a very long time? Fear, I think, for me, it's uh, I was just petrified of um, having short-term success, and, and I just well, I was so scared of that happening that it just drove me to make sure that it didn't happen. Mm. So I think a lot of it was fear and insecurity, really. And how do you so. balance that? Because fear and insecurity must make you feel all I'm sorts. Very anxious. Of, yeah. yeah, absolutely. And, and I, I I did suffer with anxiety for a long time. Um, but uh, these days, I'm, I'm so much more relaxed in, in my life anyway. I, I, I don't really, I don't need to prove anything anymore. And, and I'm, I feel very relaxed. I know what, I, what my limits are. I know what I'm good at. And I, I know my strengths. Um, but I didn't know that when I was younger. So I was still trying to find the way. And, and, uh, um, but yeah, I think yeah, a, a lot of it was fear. But, but of all, uh, also, I really sort of believed that I that I could make great records, and mm. that that was my that was my real drive to make a great record. Yeah, and has that fear gone away as you've had more success or, or felt more comfortable in yourself, or is it just still there? I feel a, a lot better about it. I mean, even even now, it's I still get a bit nervous about about. Uh, working with artists when they come up to, to my studio. I've, I've, I work from home, I've got a home studio, and the artists come to me and then we'll, we'll just sit in the, in the studio and then start writing. Um, it's a really interesting process because everybody's different and it, you're almost like a psychologist working with, with a lot of, um, especially vocalists, you know, when they're, when they're singing because they're, they're very, most vocalists are very insecure about their voices. Mm. Um, so there's a, it's always you know just finding your way, but but it's a lovely process when yeah. you, when you go in in the morning with nothing, and then at the end of the day you come out. I was playing um, uh, Jakey a track that I wrote a couple of days ago with a, a girl singer called Nina. Um, she's only young. Um, yeah, she's got some stuff on Spotify. She's got a beautiful voice, and she's really beautiful. And her and um, her, her partner that she worked with, uh, Law Affairs. Um, both incredible talents and so yeah they came they came up a couple of days ago came up with a tune i programmed it all up got it all sounding great and today it's just sent it off and just on the, in the car on the way up ricky was like listen to this really like, yeah like and you've done it that day it's a couple of two days ago and yeah, then i finished really it excited today, yeah because yeah. she because she feels like it's going to be a hit I, I, yeah, yeah she's really excited about it, it's it's a, it's can a, you tell when something is going 
It's a good. proper, is that, what they, is that what they say? It's a yeah, proper banger. It's a good it's yeah. a banger. It's a banger. For me, that was a Vauxhall Astra. <laughs> <laughs> No, Can you tell when it's I, going to be a proper banger? You, you kind of get you get feelings sometimes yeah. where you think it's, a banger, it's, got, mate. it's got something. <laughs> no, it's a beautiful job. I think it's got something. But and I'm excited yeah. as well. Like, I must be the fourth person in the world to have heard it. But you are, actually. We, yeah, yeah, you are. Yeah, yeah. yeah. exactly that. <laughs> no one's heard yeah, it. So yeah. that's why, yeah, yeah. Okay. So, Ricky, I'd like to carry on exploring this insecurities thing because I do think, <gasps> not yours necessarily, <laughs> yeah, not, yeah, not yeah. Yeah. <laughs> um Because I'm pretty obsessed. Yeah. with studying successful people. I'm like you, Jake, I love people. I love people I know and I love people I don't. It's like watching that McQueen documentary, I feel like he's like this spirit up there. I feel like a guy I know. I wear all of his clothes. I just like There's some kind of affinity there. and that's, It's a people thing, not an individual thing. I met him, by the way. Did you? Yeah, yeah. yeah. A friend of mine was his uh, PA for many years. And uh, I only met him once, but yeah. But, yeah. People think that successful people don't have insecurities. Mm. And you said something that I really want to explore. I think insecurities are inherent in successful people. Yeah. But I'll give you an example. If you're a public speaker and you don't care what other people think, you stand on the stage and you just talk to yourself and you don't really care about the audience or whatever. But to go on stage, you have to, to be a great speaker... You have to care about what people think to be connect with them. But then when you care about what they think and you don't get the praise or the laughs or the adulation, you go off absolutely depressed. And Kev, you were talking about this, weren't you, with your performing. Kev basically, it's on his podcast, so you hear it, but every time he goes, he needs the energy and the enthusiasm for the audience. And he'll come off like he's on a massive high if he gets it and on a massive low if he doesn't. But Kev's Kev, and it's kind of even not really linked to the performance. It's linked to the response from other people. Mm. And I feel like in artists, in musicians, the pain and the insecurity and the suffering is what makes the great art or makes the interesting person. Yeah. And I, I'm also, I'm well into art and creative stuff as well. And I think people think, oh, well, in, in art and creative stuff, that's okay. You know, mm. you've got to be depressed and then you can be Radiohead or, you know, you've got to be a dr drug-taking rock star and you can be Ozzy Osbourne. But I think in... I can't see any successful person who's not battled with their own insecurities. Uh, yeah, I, I think with, with, with my situation, my personal situation, writing for Kim, being my sister, and, and in the very early days, uh, uh, my father, who's um, a rock singer back in the 50s, uh, Martin Wilde, and um, he had a, a few hits, but he was a great songwriter as well. And Dad and I wrote um, uh, the first album uh, for Kim, and so there was Dad and Kim, and it was like a, this, this whole, if I didn't come up with the goods, it wasn't just me I'm letting down. It's, it's Dad and Kim, and it's family. And it's, I think that was an added pressure uh, for me. Um, but I, I, look, I look back on those days, and I, and I was only about, I don't know, I, I was 18, I think, when I wrote Kids in America. And it's just like, I look back on it, and after that, I mean, that, it kicked off its number one, not over here, actually, it's number two, but it's number one pretty much all over the world. And that was the first, one of the first songs I'd ever written. So Mickey Most, who was then uh, my mentor then, uh, he, uh, he owned uh, Rack Records at Sign Kim. He said, look, Rick, he said, um, you better go in and do an album. And it's just like, my God, you know, I've, I'd never recorded an album, but I just recorded kids and it, and it had become this huge success. So that was another added pressure. It's, it's like we kicking off so high and then keeping it at that level mm. so it, I look back on it now I just think how how did I do that and yeah. I, I really don't know but it's a, the fear thing and it's mm. that insecurity of like oh my god I can't I've got to keep it going you know yeah. so are there Jake and um, Ricky are there either any people you really admire and why uh, or just certain traits and successful people you really admire other than hard work which we've already mentioned um, who do I really admire? I'll tell you who I really admire. Um, Dave Grohl, I think he's just got, he's got everything. He's, he's living the dream. He's making great records. Fantastic. I mean, he was originally a drummer in Nirvana. <clears throat> um, obviously Kurt Cobain, uh, everyone knows what happened to Kurt. And then he steps up to the mark and now he's, then he's playing guitar amazingly, writing amazing songs, singing incredibly. Um, but not 
it's not all that. That is kind of just touching upon what he's like as a person. And everybody you meet in the industry, they all say what a lovely guy he is. And even the, you know, you, you might get a chef in a restaurant. Go, um, oh, we had David Brown. Oh, bless him. He came in and he and he thanked us for the meal and all this. That's what I. That's mm. where I judge success. Yeah. And he he's like one of the one of the good guys, mm. and I really really respect that. It's not just the success. It's yeah. it's how he's dealt with it and how he treats other people. Mm. Okay. I admire you, Rob. Yeah. I do, yeah. I love you, Parker. You But the other thing is, I think it's important to let people know if yeah. you admire them. You know, I'm always telling people, you know, I, you know, I admire you, yeah, I'm also yeah, Rick, I love him, and, you know, and Kev, you know, whatever. I mean, it's important as well, you know, I don't think people share that enough. Yeah. Do you know what I mean? I think it's important to pass it on. I think it is as well. And also, because um, I speak to people a lot on the phone one to one, I have this sort of thing in my industry where if anyone's struggling, I'll give you 15 minutes no matter what's going on in my day and the worse your shit is, the more emergency I'll make it. If you're standing on the end of the, edge of the bridge, whatever I'm doing, I'm on the golf course with my son, I'll stop and I'll give you a ring. And I've been doing that for a few years. It makes me feel really good. It's not something I tell people publicly. Um, but you just saying you believe in someone or saying something nice to them, that can be the biggest thing to them. That They might not have had that for years. Yeah. And just someone that they, because I admire you way, okay, I admire you equally um, and yeah, for, for someone that you admire to say, hey, look, you're great, that could turn someone's life around. Yeah, yeah. Really powerful. Yeah. So I'll ask you the same question I asked Kev, and then we'll do some questions from the audience. Um, the, the question that's asked on a lot of podcasts that I try to avoid, but for this one, I'm not. So Jake, um, when you're just getting good at acting and known, I don't know whether you should just get on EastEnders or you get your big role, what, what advice would you give yourself going back now? It's interesting because I, I heard you ask Kev that question earlier, and I was thinking of the. I was trying to think of the answer. I suppose you know when you hear questions on something, you think, "Oh, how would I answer that?" Um, is it arrogant to say I don't think I would give myself any advice? I don't know. I don't think I would because it, because everything that happens is like I'm at this point, so that, so I'm not sure how I would really change that or be qualified to sort of because I'm I'm. I'm really lucky, and you know, I'm all, I'm I'm always um, I'm always very thankful for what I've got. You know, it's not a day that goes by I don't give thanks. I've got a beautiful family. I've got a job that I love. I've got beautiful friends. You know, I've got people in my life that I admire, and you know, so I'm, I'm really lucky. You know what mm. I mean? And uh, yeah, so I, yeah, I would just I'd crack on. <laughs> <laughs> so your answer is. Can crack on. <laughs> <laughs> That's a hard one but to the follow. Younger me, you? Yeah. <laughs> Give me more than that. Excuse <laughs> yeah. my language. Sorry. <laughs> Drop the C bomb, but I'm really at peace. <laughs> yeah. It's all right. Um, Dom Jolly did that on, on our podcast. Well. Oh, sorry, yeah. yeah. Um, I apologise to everyone. Yeah. I forgot we were live. That's yeah, yeah. That's what I, I, we swear a lot in our, in our podcast uh, as well. That makes we? it all better, yeah. Uh, no. <laughs> uh, Ricky, would you say anything to the younger you just before you write that big song? I, I would say don't be so hard on yourself. Yeah. Uh, I think I was pre pretty hard on myself. Um, and enjoy the journey because that's it, the, the whole journey was the best part of it, mm. really. And, yeah, and I didn't really see that at the time. Yeah. It was just pressure, pressure, next day, pressure, yeah. album, next album. Uh, and I didn't enjoy it. And, uh, right. and people look, look back and they say, God, you must have been having a great, you must have been, you know, he's smashing it. And, uh, yeah. Well, it's awful. The whole, the whole process was just non-stop stress. And, um, yeah, but, I, yeah, just enjoy the journey, really. Yeah. Can I just go back, sorry, to Please. go back to what you said yeah. about insecurities, like um, successful people have all, always got insecurities. I think everyone's got insecurities. Mm. You know, I don't think it's just people in our position, actors, whatever, you know, creative people. I think everyone's got those insecurities. Yeah. And, I, and for me, the key is like how you, because everyone's got them. Mm. It's, how you, it's how you manage them and how you, they are a fuel. You know, yeah. I think if you can change that mindset and... Um, 
you know, I don't know how to do it. I don't, you know, I don't, I don't know the best way to how to explain it. But if you use it as a fuel to to drive you yeah. on, you know, everyone's got them. But I think you just have to. I think once you take that step into the unknown, it's not as scary as you as you think it's gonna be. You know what I mean? I've, I've experienced that over and over again. I did Strictly. I've never danced before. I put myself in a boxing ring. I've never boxed before. You know what I mean? I'm always pushing myself beyond something where I think, that's a bit nuts. You know what I mean? I don't know what you're doing. or uh, Yeah, you don't know what you're doing. But yeah. I think that's, um, you know, as I said, oh, I think that's where the golden. I think everyone has got those insecurities. Mm. And, yeah, they're, they're, they're a very important part of, of, uh, of driving you on. Mm. And they should be. Yeah. They should be because mm. because they are that voice that says you yeah. know you're not good enough or that drives you forward or. Um, but as know. long as you don't let it just destroy you, that's or the affect thing. Yeah, your, I, yeah, and I don't know how I don't know how to give creativity. I don't yeah. know how to give someone the key to do that, but I yeah. know that's really what you have to do. Mm. I used to have a drama teacher and and. and there's a scene when you're acting sometimes, and it's really annoying that during a scene you'll be going, "Oh, no, I've done that really bad." And then, and then you you be in the scene and you're still acting and you go, oh god, I'm so, I'm so I look so shit, <laughs> you know. And you've got this this thing, yeah, and at dialogue. the same time you're trying mm. to remember your bloody lines, and someone you, you go, oh, I didn't do that. Oh, god. oh, why are you why have you got your hand in your lap like that? Oh my, you look like you're touching your penis. Or, you know, <laughs> You've got this voice, right? And it's constantly telling you that you're not good enough and it's all this sort of thing. Yeah. Uh, and so I trained with a guy called Scott Williams, who's a brilliant teacher, and he said, look, it's fine to listen to that voice, but you've got to listen to it before or after your work. So do your work, just be in that moment, do your work, and listen to it. And his thing was that that voice is always the, is always the voice of your mum or dad, yeah. is a parent. Mm. Now, you know, there's a lot of truth in that, mm. um, you know. Yeah, I think there's a lot of truth in that, you know, so yeah, so, so I think that's something to bear in mind, mm. you know, that little voice that says you're not good enough or whatever, it's not necessarily you or because you aren't good enough, you are good, you, you know, you are good enough, I think, everyone's good enough, yeah. um, as Kev said, everyone's a superstar, that's the same thing, you are, everyone is good enough, yeah. but it's just, um, it's just, it's just managing, you have to separate that, you know what I mean? Yeah, you you have to take that negative and you have to put it in a little box and 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 recognise it for what it is, mm. and and you have to go on. You have to do your work. You have yeah. to push forward. Mm. You know. Yeah. Great. Thank you, Jay. It's funny when people talk about luck because the things that they talk about are preparedness meets opportunity, i.e., when an opportunity comes, you have to be prepared. What about going and getting the opportunity? Kevin didn't wait to be invited the second time to get on Strictly. He went. And he auditioned for it the second time. So go and seek out opportunities. Go and find stuff. Go and ask questions. Um, I, an area I've punched above my weight over the years is I've managed to meet some very, very rich people because I just ask them if they want to go out for a coffee and I just message them. And if I don't get anything, I Instagram them in a few weeks with a voice memo. No one can turn down a voice memo. <laughs> You know when you're on LinkedIn and you see a private message and it's a voice memo, you think, I know that's a pitch. But you still have to listen to it. And so, like, you, you know, it's, no, it's, yes, sometimes it's preparedness meets opportunity. Sometimes it's just keep on going for what you want until you get it. And look, I would never knock an actor who's a journeyman. Some people probably have had a, a better share of luck than others. I feel I've had a really good share of luck. I mean, I'm a white male born into, you know, like two parents who didn't get divorced, who are still together, I, I lucked out. Um, but when I failed in my life, it was because I felt a victim. And when I did all right, it was because I just kept going and sort it out. So anyone who's been failing for 10 years, fail for 15, fail for 20, fail for 30. Until, I mean, there's a brilliant documentary called The Dawn Wall. Um, I love documentaries because, like Jake, I love people. And at the end of the day, if, if you do want to better your life, we're all trying to better our lives, I think. Well, a lot of us. Um, you watch other people who've bettered their life and you learn from them. And this film, The Dawn Wall, there's two. Great film. Seen it. Yeah. Yeah, it's brilliant. Um, so there's The Dawn Wall and there's Free Solo. They're similar. And they both, these guys, climb up the hardest mountain in the, in the world, basically. You think of a mountain, you think, no, this is just a sheer face. It looks like ice. And literally, they're like half of a finger holding themselves up and there's this one section where a guy has to go across and he fails hundreds of times 
And he, uh, one, he has to climb across, like stretching further than you can. One finger, <laughs> one finger. And then he kind of has to go one finger. He's holding two fingers like this. It's just unbelievable. I'm not into climbing. I, I just step on the f- mountain. I'm so lanky. I don't need all that. <laughs> um, but wow, because he just did not give up on that wall until he got through it. And that's an analogy and reality. So just something to chuck in. I'm writing a book called Opportunity at the moment. So I've been studying luck and opportunity and stuff. So obviously not as successful as Jake and Ricky in their fields, but um, trying to figure it out like everybody else. Um, study the unified field theory. I think it's, I'm going to put a section out in my book. It's a little bit out there, but the unified field theory to simplify is basically the past, present and future, infinite, simultaneous um, actualities, eventualities, scenarios exist in this unified field. Thanks, everyone. <laughs> <laughs>